The abduction of Kristen French came after almost a year of nightmarish disappearances and deaths of teenage girls. The first of these occurred overnight on June 15, 1991, when a 14-year-old Burlington student, Leslie Mahaffey, went missing. Leslie had gone to this Max Milk store on Upper Middle Road in Burlington after attending a memorial service for a schoolmate killed in a car accident. From there, Leslie had walked home with a friend. Then, for some reason, Instead of going into the house, Leslie returned to the Max Milk store. It was the last place she was seen alive. Two weeks later, police discovered her body, dismembered and encased in concrete in the shallow waters of Lake Gibson near Thorold. The community was particularly alarmed because in the five weeks between Leslie's disappearance and her funeral, another young Burlington woman, 18-year-old Nina de Villiers, had been murdered. Police eventually ruled out any connection between the two crimes. Still, public fears that a serial killer might be operating in the Golden Horseshoe were rekindled in December of 1991, when another 14-year-old teen went missing. Terry Anderson, a St. Catharines High School student, had been out with friends on a Friday night, and like Leslie Mahaffey, had returned home only to go out again. Friends of Terry Anderson told police that Terry had experimented with the drug LSD. On May 23rd of this year, Terry Anderson's body was recovered from Port Dalhousie Harbor. An autopsy revealed no foul play. Her death appeared to be accidental and could have been the result of her consumption of LSD. On Thursday, April 16th, 1992, the day before Good Friday, police focused their attention on yet another missing teen. 15-year-old Kristen French disappeared while walking home from Holy Cross Secondary School in St. Catharines. Her disappearance was so out of character that police were notified almost immediately. Over the next two weeks, police and citizen volunteers conducted an exhaustive search of the St. Catharines area and followed up numerous leads. On Thursday, April 30th, Kristen French's body was found on a side road in Burlington. She had been sexually assaulted and asphyxiated. Her hair had been cut, and an autopsy revealed that Kristen had been held captive for much of her two-week disappearance. Shortly after the abduction of Kristen French, the Niagara Regional Police Force assembled a task force of experienced officers to investigate this crime, plus any possible connection to the murder of Leslie Mahaffey and the disappearance of Terry Anderson. Once Kristen French's body was discovered, the task force, based in Beamsville, was expanded to include investigators from the Halton Regional Police Service and the Hamilton-Wentworth Regional Police Service. The task force assumed the name Project Green Ribbon. This name was drawn from the Green Ribbon of Hope campaign launched at Kristen School after her abduction. Good evening, I'm Dan McClain. As you have just seen, Kristen French met a tragic end sometime just before Thursday, April 30th of this year. Over the next 90 minutes, we'll present a detailed examination of one of the several abductions and murders of young women which have shocked our community in the past year. Our purpose is to reach out to the community in the hope that someone can provide even a small detail of information which will help police solve this crime. Throughout this program, we'll be briefed by criminal behavior experts from this country as well as from the United States. We will hear for the first time eyewitness accounts of the sequence of events surrounding the abduction of Kristen French. We'll provide you with the most up-to-date information on the investigation. Some of it you will hear for the first time tonight. Inspector Vince Bevan is the chief investigator of Project Green Ribbon, the Joint Forces Police Task Force, which has been investigating the abduction and murders of both Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French. Vince, why have you chosen to go to the public in this manner at this time? Dan, since Kristen's disappearance, the public response to this crime has been beyond anything we've experienced before. That support has been demonstrated in a number of ways, including the high level of calls that have been continuing to come into our Beamsville offices. We felt that a program such as this would give us an opportunity to deal with misinformation and help the public focus on the facts. We hope that information that people may have considered to be insignificant up till now can be drawn into the investigation. With at least two unsolved murders that we're facing right now, why is it that you appear to be focusing on Kristen French? Dan, I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that we're focusing solely on Kristen because we continue to actively investigate Leslie's death. 
But as the viewers will see tonight, some of the leads that we have in this case are fresh. And I think there's a number of things the public can help us with. We expect to hear some new information tonight on this program, and there's been a lot of publicity recently about this information. Can you explain why it has not been made public before now? Dan, I think we all have to acknowledge that Kristen's case is very high profile and very important to anyone who lives in this community. We had to be very careful not to tip our hand too early, because if we were wrong in certain respects, we could have raised the confidence level of whoever is responsible, and that may have resulted in their acting out again. Okay, now you are also seeking information from our viewers tonight. What kind of information are you looking for from our viewers? Dan, tonight at our offices in Beamsville, we have 41 trained volunteers who are ready to receive calls. Our number out there is 1-800-267-6357. We're trying to get, gather information about cars similar to the one we have in the studio tonight, and especially after the viewers see the information that's presented tonight, we're hoping to gather information about possible suspects. Someone out there has a clue, and we're interested in talking to them. Okay, let's now look at the details of the Kristen French abduction as we know them to date. Kristen Don French was born on May 10th, 1976. On April 16th of this year, she was 15 years old. Kristen came from a solid and close St. Catherine's family. She was keenly athletic, with a passion for precision skating and rowing. Her unique mix of youthful innocence and strong sense of commitment make Kristen a rare individual. Those who knew her well admired both her maturity and her love of life. Kristen was an honor student at Holy Cross Secondary School, located on Lake Street in St. Catharines. It was Thursday, the 16th of April, at 2.45 p.m., when she left Holy Cross School and headed home. The school is within easy walking distance of Kristen's home, and she usually walked home from school. On her way, she passed the Grace Lutheran Church on Linwell Road. Police believe that this is where Kristen met her abductor and was forced into a car. The vehicle sped off heading eastbound on Linwell Road towards Geneva Street. Police immediately launched a large-scale search for Kristen and the vehicle which abducted her. This vehicle is believed to be a cream-colored Camaro in good condition. Vince, about this Camaro, uh, shortly after Kristen's death, your task force launched a major search for this vehicle. Can you tell me how the Camaro sticker program is going? Dan, as soon as we entered into this investigation, we realized we were dealing with tremendous numbers. So we needed some way of marking vehicles that had already been checked and cleared. This marking program assisted patrol officers who could then easily identify the ones that had not yet been checked. It also assisted the public because uh, the public would see a car traveling down the road which was not yet stickered and of course call in that license number to our hotline. Where all of you held these sticker programs thus far and will you continue them? Dan, certainly we're going to continue the program. So far we've been in Niagara, Hamilton, Halton, Brantford and Guelph. We're going to continue in those areas and as well we're going to move further out into southern Ontario. When your investigators are looking at a car such as the one that we have here today, what is it they're looking for? Each of our investigators is trained to look for specific things, Dan. The model year, of course, is something that we're not sure of, so it's not that important to us, but the color is essential in our investigation. So they check the color, and obviously they look to see if there's a recent repaint job on the vehicle. It's important that we know who owns and who was using the vehicle in April. And, of course, there's one or two secrets that we can't yet divulge. Okay. Aside from the sticker program, are there other avenues that you are taking to try to find this particular Camaro? Dan, what we're engaged in is a process of elimination. So we're looking at gas stations, body shops, do-it-yourself centers, mm -hmm. wrecking yards, and of course auto recyclers as well. You mentioned body shops. Why? Because uh, we understood that the car was in pretty good shape. Actually, the car is in pretty good shape for, its, uh, for the age of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. But we can't overlook the fact that at some point the owner may have tried to change the color of the vehicle to disguise the car. Vince, let's take a look now at what uh, you've been able to reconstruct about this car using the Camaro that we do have here in the studio today. Dan, this car is fairly close to the model that we're looking for. We need to focus on the color. The model year may or may not be exact, but this vehicle fairly well represents the car that was involved in Kristen's abduction. It's a very plain car. It has black wall tires. 
there is some indication of rust on the left rear quarter panel. And on the driver's door, there is some gray primer paint, which indicates that there may have been a recent repair. The vehicle may or may not have had a spoiler, but of course those are easily removed in any event. And in addition, we have found that the car may have had a red or maroon interior. Okay, what can our viewing public do to help you find this vehicle? Up until now, we've had an awful lot of tips from motorists, and we're encouraging them to continue with that. We're looking for a vehicle that may have been in somebody's possession prior to the abduction and has not been seen since. So we're interested in having calls about that. As well, we're interested in hearing from the public if they're suspicious of someone who has a similar car. Recapping what we've learned so far, police believe the public can still help in locating this car with the description we have just been given. Our personal response center hotline number is 1-800-267-6357. Call if you have any information on the Camaro or anything else that might help in solving this crime. Just one thing, while we have over 40 trained people standing by to take your call, you could still get a busy signal, so please be patient and keep trying. Your call is important to us. Coming up, some eyewitness accounts of the abduction. Such an intense feeling of loss that I just don't have room for anger right now. Sometimes I don't think that I've really accepted the fact that she's gone. It seems like she's just away. The abduction of Kristen French continues. This program is supported by the following companies who generously donated both expertise and equipment. IBM, known worldwide as a leader in computer systems and supplier in part of the computer facilities required for this production. The CANCOM satellite network and their Value Vision programming package for providing this program unscrambled to satellite viewers nationwide. And Radio Shack, Canada's value leader in electronics and supplier in part of the computer equipment used in the production of this program. I just don't have the heart to put anything away yet. Right now, it would be like packing away my memories. And I just can't do that. I like her room just as it is now because I often come in and I'll sit and talk to her or just think about her. This is where Donna French comes to find solace. It's Kristen's bedroom. In the evenings when she's most troubled by her daughter's absence, looking at Kristen's things is comforting. Her mementos, photo albums, meaningful snapshots, everything as Kristen left it. Makeup on the table, stuffed animals on her bed. What really gets tough is if you think of the things that will never come. The fact that she'll never marry won't be able to plan a wedding. She was at a, a wedding a couple years ago, and when they went trying on bride, bridesmaids' dresses, uh, she found a wedding gown that she just loved. And I says, well, try it on, Kristen. So she tried it on, and she looked so beautiful. And then Terry's sister is supposed to get married in October. And uh, Kristen was to be a bridesmaid again. And they went and chose their dresses and they ordered them. They were green. That's the hardest part, is just thinking ahead to things that you won't be able to do. Was she even older? She had a child. At least I'd have had a granddaughter by her. So disturbing for Donna to know that not only was Kristen killed, she was held captive for 13 days and there was nothing she could do to help. Donna's plagued by recurring nightmares of the ordeal that Kristen was put through. I see a car and her being forced into it. And I just can't go past that. All I keep thinking of is what she must have been thinking. I'd had one nightmare. And that was right after they found her. 
And I could just hear her crying out to me, and I couldn't find her. I just looked and looked and couldn't find her. Now we'll look at Kristen's abduction as pieced together from the points of view of the five separate witnesses. Vince, when did these witnesses come forward? The first witnesses began to come forward on Good Friday evening to assist us in this investigation. Prior to that, we had found Kristen's shoe and a lock of hair in the parking lot of Grace Lutheran Church. Okay, let's look at that reenactment. Now let's take a look at the abduction again, this time using information supplied to police by five separate witnesses. Our first witness was a schoolmate of Kristen's from Holy Cross School. And Easter weekend coming up, hope that the weather doesn't throw your plans off. I left school at 2.45 in the afternoon to go home and drove south on Lake Street to Linwell Road. I turned left and drove east on Linwell. I know Kristen French and saw her walking east on the north sidewalk of Linwell Road, west of Howard Street. Kristen was wearing her Holy Cross uniform and a jacket. It would have been around 10 to or 5 to 3. When I heard that Kristen had been abducted, I got a hold of the police and told them what I had seen. I just wish I had been paying more attention to the things surrounding Kristen at that time. The story is picked up by a 21-year-old woman who was driving home from work on Linwell Road at about the same time. As I passed Lake Street on Linwell Road, I saw a creamy yellow Camaro-style car pulling off partway onto the right shoulder of the road. It slowed down in front of me and came to a rolling stop opposite St. Giles Church, the one just west of Grace Lutheran Church. I could not pass this car without entering the oncoming lane. The car was not fancy, and it was not a newer model car. There were two men in the car. The driver of the car had his window rolled down. He spoke to a girl who was walking on the north sidewalk of Linwell Road. The girl was dressed in a Holy Cross school uniform. She had long brown hair below her shoulders. The girl was speaking back to the driver. As I passed this car, I looked at the driver. He had brown hair and was about 24 to 30 years old. I may not be able to identify the car because I'm not good with cars, but his face I will never forget. I talked to several of my friends about the abduction of Kristen French, and I realized I had valuable information. I felt it was my duty as a member of the community to tell the police. This witness was one of at least two who were able to provide police with a crucial clue. There were two abductors. Not one. Our next witness, a 49-year-old woman, saw what almost certainly was Kristen struggling with her captors in the church parking lot. As she approached the church, she saw the Camaro. This car was parked parallel to Linwell Road. The passenger door was open. I saw a male bent into the car, and all I could see was his rear end and his legs. His legs were moving as if he were being pushed back, and he appeared to be struggling. His body was aimed into the back seat. I thought it was teenagers just fooling around, so I drove by and continued on. On the following day, which was Good Friday, I saw a news flash about a girl missing in St. Catharines. I remembered I was in St. Catharines on Linwell Road at about that time. I wondered if what I thought was teenagers fooling around in the church parking lot was related to Kristen French. I called the police and told them everything I knew. I wish I could have been more helpful. I wish I had seen more. I only hope that all those who saw anything that day or know anything about this murder will tell the police. Later, when police combed the church parking lot, they found two more pieces of evidence. Kristen's right shoe and a large lock of Kristen's hair, which had been cut off. Our fourth witness, a 37-year-old woman, was driving a car which almost collided with the Camaro. We were driving west on Linwell Road in a school crossing zone where the speed is 40 kilometers per hour. Suddenly, a car appeared right in front of me. It was speeding out of the east side driveway of Grace Lutheran Church. I hit the brakes to avoid hitting the car. We continued west on Linwell Road, and the car that cut us off went east on Linwell. I think the car had round headlights. It didn't have big tires. The windows were dark. It was a plain car, in good shape, but it needed a little work. It was not a Trans Am. I would say it was an older Firebird Camaro or Berlinetta. On Monday, April 20th, I got a phone call from a friend who heard about the abduction of Kristen French. I then put the two incidents together. On April 23rd, I was hypnotized by a forensic hypnotist. 
This helped me to recall that the car was a yellow beige color. I only remember seeing the driver because he looked right at me. I saw his face and I know I would recognize him again if I saw him. I'm glad I was able to help the police. I just wish I could have gotten the license plate of the car. Now to our fifth witness, who also had a near miss with the Camaro. Shortly after three o'clock, I was driving south on Geneva Street. The traffic wasn't too heavy. It was a miserable overcast day. When I got to Linwell Road, the traffic light was green for me. I saw a cream-colored car to my right. It was going east on Linwell Road. The car didn't stop for the red light, and it cut right in front of me. The driver of the car looked right at me. As soon as the car turned the corner, it started to fishtail. As the car was turning, I also saw a person in the passenger side of the car. This person was turned around in their seat and appeared to be reaching into the back. There was a flailing of arms pushing back and forth. I thought it was horseplay between the front seat passenger and someone in the back. This is a terrible thing to have happen in our community. I'm glad I told the police what I saw. I feel good about being able to help. As you can see in the case of our five witnesses, they each saw something that was relatively insignificant. But pieced together with what other witnesses saw, it becomes very important. Then some of the information that these witnesses gave police came only after they'd undergone forensic hypnosis. Why hypnosis? Well, Dan, some witnesses vividly recalled the incident and required no assistance whatsoever. For other witnesses, early in the investigation, we resorted to hypnosis in order to assist them to focus on the events and recall small forgotten details. We've had very good success with hypnosis in the past, and we elected to use it again in order to assist witnesses to relive the incident. How often do you use this technique? Generally, hypnosis is reserved for very important cases, especially those where eyewitness uh, accounts are very critical to the case. Okay, joining us now is a leading practitioner of forensic hypnosis, Dr. George Matheson. Dr. Matheson is a clinical psychologist, formerly chief of the Department of Psychology at Etobicoke General Hospital, and now in private practice. And for the past 15 years, he has been using hypnosis to aid police in their investigation. George Matheson, what is the role of hypnosis in crime fighting? What hypnosis can do is work with witnesses to help them to relax and then to go back into the back of their mind, back into memories they may have of events they either saw or heard or were involved in, and help them to remember those things and give details. When we hear hypnosis, the word, we think sleep. What is the relationship there? People usually think about going to sleep, but really hypnosis is much more like a daydream. You always know where you are, but in, your mind can sort of drift off. In this case, instead of drifting off to a fantasy, what you can do is drift off into the memories that are at the back of your mind. In the reenactment that we just saw, I believe the fourth witness uh, called or recalled the car being a creamy beige color. From other cases, uh, what other kinds of details can you get through hypnosis? Well, witnesses can usually remember description of vehicles, description of suspects or other people around, description of events, sequence of events, what happened first, what happened second, conversations, almost anything that you either see or hear or feel or think or in any way experience. What's your success rate in the case of uh, past time, say three, four, five months? Well, that's a usual period of time for me to work with. It's ideal for me to get people in the first few days but in most cases, it's a few months before they come forward. In my experience, I've worked with people going back as much as 20 years and helped them to remember things that have led successfully to convictions. Do all witnesses have to be hypnotized to remember this kind of detail? No, it's as Vince said. I mean, lots of people can remember things quite easily. But I work with people who have the sense that there's something more there at the back of their mind. They can't quite put their finger on it. Okay, for our viewers at home, is there any cause for concern about being hypnotized? Absolutely none. If it's done by a professional who knows what he's doing, it's a comfortable experience. They usually feel relaxed when it's over, and they feel emotionally and usually morally good for having been involved. Okay, let's look at what we've learned in this segment. We've confirmed the location of the abduction by the evidence found at Grace Lutheran Church. We know that there are simple memory enhancement techniques to assist people in remembering something they may have seen three, four months ago or longer. We know that there were two abductors, not one. And later in this broadcast, experts will give us a detailed psychological profile of these offenders. Once again, our hotline number is 1-800-267-6357. Call if you have any information that might help in solving this crime. Our team is standing by to take your call. Keep trying. If you get a busy signal, that number again is 1-800-267-6357. Next, we explore whether or not Kristen was stalked by her abductor. And we ask your help in finding two people who police believe may have watched Kristen 
as she struggled with her abductors. I'll always consider her my best friend. No matter who there is, how many there are, she'll be, like, number one. The abduction of Kristen French continues. Precision skating was Kristen's first love. When she strapped on her skates as a young child, gliding across the ice was her passion. She was an accomplished skater, and she has the medals to prove it. But Kristen never wanted to show off. Kristen was very beautiful, but she was not the type of person who liked to stand out above anybody. She liked to be part of the crowd. Usually a skater gets to a point where they have to decide whether they want to pursue the individual end of skating or choose precision. And there was no doubt in Kristen's mind she would much rather go with precision. She liked the team feeling. She liked traveling with the team. It was the team feeling that led Kristen to rowing for Holy Cross High School, up at 5 in the morning, practicing every day. When her coach needed someone to fill in, she could always count on Kristen. Well, I had two crews going in eight and a four, and I'd need an extra person for the eight, and she'd be the one I could call to come out and row with them. And uh, she just, no matter what you asked her to do, she would do it. May 10th was the most important race of the year for the Holy Cross team. It would have been Kristen's 16th birthday. They were going to win one for her. They were lagging behind at one point in last place. But at the 1500 mark, the crew turned to Kristen for inspiration. Want to win it for Kristen? They were gaining ground. Well, it, just, like, it just felt like she was there giving us an extra couple yeah. strokes to get us ahead. It was, yeah. it was a really amazing feeling. Before all that was important was winning, and then it soon became Krista. Hard stroke for Kristen, come on. Gonna pull this finish for Kristen. They walked away with the gold. They'd never won a medal before. And handing it over to her parents, Doug and Donna, made them feel like Kristen was there to receive it too. Make sure you keep it up. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> In our last segment, we saw five witness accounts, each bringing a bit more information. Vince, were there any other witnesses that you're aware of? A number of witnesses have come forward. Each one of them has brought with them a piece of the puzzle. However, we know there are others. For instance, we know there was an older couple on Linwell Road who had an opportunity to see all of the events in the parking lot of Grace Lutheran Church. They can complete the puzzle for us. Okay, what we're going to do now is show you the incident again this time from the perspective of the elderly couple. Several of the people police interviewed recall seeing an elderly couple standing on the south side of Linwell Road, facing Grace Lutheran Church at the very moment Kristen would have been struggling with her abductors. Witnesses recall a couple wearing beige, bomber-style jackets. The woman appeared to have gray-blonde, medium-length hair that looked like a grown-out perm. Police are quite certain that this couple saw the entire episode because at least two people recalled the woman holding one hand up to her mouth while pointing towards the Camaro with the other. Neighbors in the area questioned by police say they saw the same couple walking through the neighborhood on a regular basis prior to Kristen's abduction. But since then, the couple has disappeared. Joining us now at Grace Lutheran Church, the site where Kristen was abducted in St. Catharines, is Sergeant Kate Cavanaugh, behavior analyst with the OPP. Kate, with your experience in analyzing human behavior, why do you think these witnesses have not come forward? Well, Dan, it's difficult for us to assume why they may not have come forward up until now, and I don't think we should be too quick to judge. The information that they have regarding this case is vital, however, and we would really like to speak with them. Kate, I'm curious, I just don't understand why a couple who would have seen this would not come forward. Well, they may assume that others have provided similar details and that the information that they can provide has already been given by others. But this isn't the case. We need to speak with them directly. Could the couple be afraid? It's possible, Dan. They may be hesitant or fearful about coming forward, but they needn't be. 
the information that they have and their identities will be kept in the utmost confidence. So what you're telling us, Kate, is what they have to say is extremely important. That's right. The information that they have is vital to this case, and we would definitely like to speak with them, and they're listening. If they're listening now, I ask them to please call in. Should these people be concerned that they haven't called in until now? The reason why these people haven't contacted us before now is really not all that important, Dan. We just need to speak with them, and I ask them to please call us. Thank you, Kate. Vince, I understand that a reward has been offered in this case. Yes, Dan, the Toronto Sun has authorized a $100,000 reward, which will be paid to the person who provides information that directly leads to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for the abduction of Kristen French. We'd like at this point to give you the phone number once again. Our hotline phone number is 1-800-267-6357. And Vince, from what you know, is there any indication of pre-planning or premeditation in Kristen's abduction? Was Kristen being stalked? Dan, we have information from people who tell us about a similar car in the area in the days prior to Kristen's abduction. We believe that these people were stalking her. Evidence supplied by witnesses interviewed by police now indicates that Kristen may have been stalked days before her abduction. At least one witness saw a cream-colored Camaro or Firebird in good condition parked over the sidewalk in the north entrance to Lakeport High School on the Monday and Tuesday before Kristen was abducted. Witnesses indicate that on at least one of these days, the driver was staring down the sidewalk towards Holy Cross Secondary School at the very time Kristen would have been leaving school. Lakeport High School and Holy Cross Secondary School are located adjacent to each other on Lake Street in St. Catharines. At approximately 2.40 p.m. on Thursday, April 16th, at least one more witness noticed a cream-colored Camaro in good shape, circled the parking lot of Lakeport High School six times, and then turned eastbound onto Linwell Road. This was only minutes before Kristen was abducted. Is there someone who would do something like this with premeditation more dangerous than someone else who would act spontaneously? Dan, in other cases, victims find themselves in situations which raises their level of risk. In this particular case, through stalking, these people learn Kristen's route home. They may have taken advantage of the weather conditions that day. There was a light rain, and people were tending to pay it less attention to what was going on. But they took Kristen in order to act out their fantasy. So they wanted Kristen, not just any girl. The evidence seems to point to the fact that they were after Kristen and not someone else. That's a fairly strong statement to make. We don't want to heighten paranoia in the community. What we do want is to raise the level of caution. I think it's important that everybody realize that this danger is out there and that it's time that we be our brothers and sisters keepers and look out for one another. Well, in these troubled time, that's probably good advice for all of us. So what we have learned is police believe that Kristen was stalked. We also know that there's an elderly couple who may have had a very good look at the incident. Police are hoping that if they are watching this program, they will still come forward to assist in this investigation. We remind you that a $100,000 reward has been offered by the Toronto Sun in this case. We have many trained volunteers on duty now at the Green Ribbon Task Force headquarters in Beamsville. They are ready to take calls from the public. That hotline number is 1-800-267-6357. When we come back, psychological profile of an abductor. Oh, my first reaction was, I can't believe it. Half of the world was praying for Kristen. And he didn't listen. He didn't answer our prayers. The abduction of Kristen French continues. This program is supported by the following companies who generously donated both expertise and equipment. Mediacom, Canada's leading outdoor advertising company and its associated poster network companies for the donation of outdoor advertising space. Patriot Computers, Canada's computer company, working hard to build better computers and a better Canada. And Iztec, manufacturers of Westcam airborne surveillance systems and equipment used in hundreds of police and search and rescue applications. To deal with the pressure, I think it's something to do with um, becoming a great athlete.
gymnastics has given me my confidence and my self-esteem. I'm drug-free because I think it's hard work that makes you the best you can be. Integrity makes true champions. Rivalry. Root beer. Revenge. First loves. Last rights. Giving in. Putting out. Hard truth. Soft sweaters. Share the lives on the home front. Life stories. Love stories. Our stories. Join Dan Rather and his award-winning team for an in-depth look at the stories behind the news headlines. Watch 48 Hours, Wednesday at 10 on CHCH-TV 11. I don't think she should be remembered by, you know, the girl who was found in Burlington. That it's, you know, because that wasn't what she was. That wasn't what Kristen French was, especially to her friends. Kristen's best friend, Erin, was shattered by her murder. And Kristen is always on her mind. I owe her a lot in my life. She helped me see things more clearly. She made me feel better about myself. It didn't matter who you were. She, you know, she'd smile, she'd be nice. She had a beautiful smile. I, I was talking about that a couple nights ago, and, and she, you know, it wasn't a fake smile. She always had a real smile, no matter what it was for, and she was always laughing. Kristen was a happy-go-lucky kind of girl. She loved doing all the typical teenage things, going shopping for clothes, talking on the phone to her boyfriend. Kristen was in love for the first time. She uh, just lived to dash home and get on the phone and talk to Elle and see what time he had come over or if she could go down there. And, and I know she would just be walking six inches off the ground all the way from school home, anticipating either Elton's call or else she'd call him. Friends meant so much to Kristen. She'd go out of her way to make them feel welcome or offer help. When her friend Tara broke her leg, it was Kristen who was there to lend a helping hand. Well, I missed a lot of a lot of school, and she took my work for me, like in science and French. And she, I had to write a French, French test, so she brought the test to my house, and I wrote it. And she watched me, you know. Kristen used to bring her friends to the house all the time. They loved going there. Her friends still come over just to say hello to her parents, but it's something that's very painful for her mother, Donna. It's kind of bittersweet. Um, it's nice to see them. Um, but when I hug them, Tonight, Vince, you've been providing us with a lot of information about the abduction and murder of Kristen French. From the facts of this case, do you get any kind of an indication about the type of person who would commit a crime like this? What we do, Dan, is we go out and we gather specific facts. We put that information together and we send it to someone who's a trained expert. For instance, Kate Cavanaugh with the Ontario Provincial Police is a profiler. We're going to hear the term profiler a number of times in the next couple of segments. Can you tell us what a profiler is? A profiler, that's a term used... Uh, to describe someone who's a trained professional who will take all the facts of the case and based on behavioral analysis give us, give us an opinion. Okay, you've mentioned Kate Kavanaugh. She is a profiler now. Let's join her at number one side road in Burlington, the site where Kristen's body was found. Kate, what can you tell us about the type of offender responsible for this crime? Dan, identifying the type of offender responsible for a crime is often referred to as psychological profiling. Our approach to an investigation as profilers is somewhat different than traditional methods. You say that your methods are different. How is that? When investigators seek our opinion, we take each detail of the crime into consideration, such as in this case, where Kristen's body was found here along the side road. We use all of this information as well as our own training, experience, and often intuition to provide investigators with a psychological profile of the most likely type of offender responsible. Kate, how accurate have these profiles been in past? 
Well, Dan, as you know, the study of human behavior is not, nor ever will be, an exact science. We deal in probabilities rather than possibilities because you must understand that anything is possible. However, in the past, we've had quite a lot of success when comparing our profiles of the offenders with the actual person who is later arrested. How many officers are trained in this field? We have two officers here in Canada, myself and an RCMP officer in Ottawa. We were both trained by the FBI in Quantico, and we all work very closely together. It seems to me, Kate, that profiling is very much a cooperative effort. It is a cooperative effort, and we've had a lot of success drawing upon the experience and expertise of not only profilers, but other investigators from varied backgrounds. FBI Special Agent Chuck Wagner, who is also a trained profiler, is with us in our studio. Vince, how did the FBI become involved in Kristen's case? Dan, there's been a long-standing personal and professional relationship between the Buffalo FBI office and local law enforcement in Canada. We felt that we needed the assistance of the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime, and we called Chuck. Chuck, what do you do when you are contacted by a police group and ask for assistance? My primary responsibility, Dan, is to be the field coordinator and act as liaison between the local agency and the National Center at Quantico. I discuss the specifics of any case with the investigators, obtain the necessary case materials, and forward them to Quantico along with my own preliminary assessments and observations. Once at Quantico, the case is analyzed and the analysis provided to the investigators. In this case, we have had and continue to have telephone consultations regarding the case, and we have also sent an investigator from Canada to the National Center to participate in a group consultation with the agents there. Well, at the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime, there are experts in serial killings. There's been a lot of public speculation as to whether Kristen's murder is connected to some of the other murders of young women that have occurred in this area during the past year. Now, here is another detail that has troubled investigators. On July 25th, 1991, murdered Burlington teen Leslie Mahaffey was laid to rest in Halton Hills Memorial Gardens on Guelph Line in Burlington. Nine months later, on April 30th, 1992, the body of Kristen French was found along the south side of side road number one, just one half a kilometer east of the Guelph Line. Evidence indicated that Kristen's body had not been there long before it was discovered. The choice of side road number one as a place to dispose of Kristen's body has perplexed investigators. Although this is a rural area, there is a residence relatively close by. However, the choice of this particular area may be significant. Only a narrow green belt separates the site where Kristen's body was found from the grave site of Leslie Mahaffey in Halton Hills Memorial Gardens. Investigation is now underway to carefully analyze and compare other details between the cases of 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey who was abducted from Burlington and found murdered in the St. Catharines area, and 15-year-old Kristen French, who was abducted from St. Catharines and found murdered in Burlington. Chuck, with your involvement in both these cases, does the FBI believe this is a serial situation? We're taking a very close look at that, Dan. There are similarities between these two crimes, and there are dissimilarities as well. New evidence has been developed and continues to be developed since our original analysis. And of course, new evidence can alter the linkages between crimes. We intend to maintain an open mind and continue to analyze the evidence as it's developed. There's another question that comes to mind after looking at the site where Kristen's body was disposed of is the recent exhumation of Leslie Mahaffey. That added a great deal to public speculation that this was a serial situation. Can you comment on that? Dan, as I mentioned earlier, we did and continue to investigate Leslie's death. New information came in which caused us to reevaluate certain things about the circumstances of her death. We decided on exhumation, and as a result, we have gathered information that will help us in the investigation into Leslie's death. It's too early to tell at this point if there, any of that information is of value in Kristen's case. Well, was, we've already mentioned the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime at the FBI Academy at Quantico, Virginia, plays a key role in this investigation. A fact not widely known to the public is the existence of a close working relationship between police forces in Canada and the FBI in the United States. The FBI operates a special unit 
called the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. Police forces from all over North America often make use of the expertise of the center when faced with unusual, bizarre, or repetitive violent crimes. The National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime is a law enforcement-oriented behavioral science and data processing center. On the center staff are experts in such areas as serial killers, homicide, sadism, child abduction, and air hijacking. The center also provides psychological profiles of unknown offenders. It helps police forces plan their strategies for investigating major crimes and even helps police officers hone their interviewing techniques. Not surprising, the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime has been actively involved in the investigation of the abduction and murder of Kristen French. Supervisory Special Agent Greg McCrary is leading the group of analysts at Quantico, which is working on this case. Greg now joins us live by satellite from Washington, D.C. And Greg, what are your impressions of this case? Uh, the impressions, Dan, deal uh, with the fact that this is a stranger homicide. That is, the, there's no known relationship between the victim and the offenders here. Traditionally, those cases are potentially more difficult to solve. However, there's a uh, clear indication here that this case is solvable. I'm confident that it, it will be solved. Task Force has made a lot of progress. Uh, with the public's assistance, uh, this case can be solved even sooner. Greg, from your experience, what can you tell us about a person who would kidnap a girl like Kristen in broad daylight from along what is apparently a very busy street? Yeah, it's certainly it's a high-risk uh, crime from the viewpoint of the uh, offender to, uh, to do this. But we know this is sexually motivated homicide, and we know that the offenders who commit that sort of crime uh, have a very rich fantasy life. They just didn't do this crime suddenly, that they, there was a, uh, a process where they, that led up to the commission of the crime. Uh, the fantasy becomes more and more real, and they begin to act out on the fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, what this means is that they did some surveillance. Uh, they stalked uh, perhaps Kristen or other girls or tried to, to approach them uh, prior to the offense. So the public needs to be aware that that these offenders uh, surveyed uh, Kristen not only at the school where she was at, uh, but they may well have uh, been surveilling uh, teenagers at other areas where teenagers congregate and hang out. So an incident that they feel may not be related may be very important to the investigation and would encourage them to call in with any information they have about any adult male or males uh, hanging out at areas where teenagers congregate, uh, doing any surveillance, perhaps uh, uh, trying this con or ruse uh, to uh, bring someone to the car to ask directions or do something like that. Any, any kind of uh, activity like that that anyone has experienced, we'd encourage them to call in and report it. In this particular case, we know that there are two offenders. What, right. sort, of, what sort of thumbnail sketch profile can you give us on these two men? When we have uh, two offenders uh, in a case like this, uh, Traditionally, one is a dominant offender. You're going to have one who's the leader, the driving force behind the crime. And then the second offender is going to be subservient. He's going to be the follower. Uh, he's going to follow the lead of the dominant offender. So when we profile a case like this, we profile the dominant offender because it's his behavior that we're seeing evident in the uh, crime scene. Right now, let's just quickly recap, and here is what we've learned so far. The offender will have fantasized about committing this act well in advance. And it's important to remember that the FBI feel this case is ultimately solvable, but it will be solved sooner with the public's help. So don't forget, there is a $100,000 Toronto Sun reward available for information leading directly to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for the abduction of Kristen French. And finally, make a note of our Green Ribbon hotline phone number. It is 1-800-267-6357. When we come back, we'll continue our psychological profile on these two abductors. I was just so sure that they'd find her. I was just so sure. And then when we found her, I just kept thinking, why did he have to kill her? The abduction of Kristen French continues. For Doug and Donna French, being at home in the evenings can be difficult. 
that's when they miss their daughter Kristen the most. The hundreds of letters that have been pouring in offering condolences from people they don't even know helps them through it. At times you'll see a smile form on their face. They're thinking of the fond memories of Kristen. Kristen was just a wonderful person. She uh, was very sensitive. She's very warm and loving. She had a very happy nature. A happy child right from the start, always smiling. She had a smile that would light up a room. It was just wonderful. They remember the little girl in the water wings learning to swim, the birthday parties, fun with friends in the backyard. Kristen's friends, they call the Four Musketeers. You gotta reflect back, I guess, of all the good times we had with her and all the wonderful memories that we had with her because we had a lot of good times. The family's recent trip to Disney World during the March break. Her mother remembers how pretty she was, her long, dark hair. She had such lovely hair. She had lovely, thick, shiny hair. And uh, she always made a point of looking nice, and part of that was grooming her hair. Sitting around the kitchen table, her family cherishes all the memories these photos hold. Pictures that mean so much now that Kristen's no longer here. I'd love to have been able to hold her and kiss her and tell her I love her. It just wasn't possible. And I know Kristen knows. I talk to her all the time. And uh, she talks to me. I'm sure she sends little messages down now and then. Little thoughts will just fly in my head and... It's something I know Kristen would have said, and I'm sure it's coming from her. So she knows. Continuing our psychological profile of the abductors, we mentioned earlier that one is a leader and one is a follower. Greg, can you tell us more about the so-called dominant offender? Uh, yes, Dan. The uh, dominant offender here in this case is a uh, truly a human predator. Uh, Clinically or psychologically, the terms are used are antisocial personality disorder or psychopath or sociopath. Uh, uh, but really what it comes down to is just a cold-blooded uh, killer. Uh, he's a manipulator, one that exploits and uses people, uh, systems, things, anything around him he uses uh, for his own gratification. Does he feel any kind of guilt, any kind of remorse for his actions? No, no guilt or uh, no remorse. He doesn't care about the suffering he caused the victim, the victim's family, or, or the uh, community uh, in general. He has, has no care about that. That carries over also into his personal life, and that would be uh, uh, a situation where if he is in a consensual relationship, if he has a wife or girlfriend, he's the dominant uh, personality in that relationship as well, that uh, a wife or girlfriend or children would be very submissive uh, to him. He'd be the boss. He would be in total control. Uh, no one would be allowed to question his, his comings or goings or his activities. Mm -hmm. uh, and a high probability this would be an abusive uh, relationship as well. Uh, there's a hatred here, certainly a hatred for women, and this would carry over in the other areas of his life uh, as well. So if he's in a relationship with a woman, it could well be an abusive relationship where they're being physically uh, abused. Greg, would the dominant offender here have some kind of uh, predictable previous history? Yes, uh, yes, Dan, he would. He'd have a, a history of uh, criminal offenses dealing with, with uh, criminal sexual uh, deviancy, perhaps uh, uh, flashing or exhibitionism, uh, obscene phone calls, perhaps prior sexual assaults. He may not necessarily have been arrested for all of those crimes, but the people around him know, know that he has that. And I, I do believe there's a high degree of probability he spent some time in prison, probably on a uh, sexual offense uh, or, or some crime against a person. Might there be some kind of stressful event have taken place prior to Kristen's abduction? Exactly, exactly right, Dan. The, uh, one of the uh, things that we see consistently, why does an offender act out at one time and not another? Mm -hmm. And it's almost always due to some sort of situational stressor or uh, environmental cue or something that triggers uh, the uh, homicidal event. Why does he act out one time and not another? Generally, it's, it's the result of a stressor in his life. Now, that could be the result of... Uh, a fight with his wife, or maybe, uh, uh, you know, she left or th tried to throw him out or, or somehow, uh, you know, uh, bucked his authority or control. It could be that he got fired from a job or had an argument or something. There'd be some stressor in his life that just prior to this incident. 
You mentioned job. Let's talk a little about that. What might his occupation be? Uh, we feel that the, uh, the offender here in this case is uh, employed in a semi-skilled capacity. He works with his hands, a manual uh, employment. Uh, high probability he works with power tools, uh, equipment, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, he may have a, a shop at home. He may have uh, an area of power tools or things that he has at home. Uh, he uh, works with power tools. Could be working in a metal shop, uh, another uh, consideration also. Okay, we know that Kristen was held captive for much of the time that uh, she was held, nearly two weeks. How would this affect the abductors' normal lives, normal routines? Certainly would have been disruptive, and that's another thing the public needs to be aware of, uh, too, is the fact from this period, from uh, April 16th to the 30th, uh, that during that two-week period, their normal routine would have been disrupted. Uh, we know that Kristen was kept alive for the majority of that time, uh, what that means is that the offenders would have uh, had to monitor her to ensure that uh, she wasn't able to escape and uh, also to go there and uh, tragically to, uh, to assault her as well. So we know that what that means is that their normal routine and schedule, whatever that would have been, would have been disrupted uh, significantly during that two-week time. That doesn't mean they missed work altogether if they're employed. If they were at work, uh, they w likely to be preoccupied and thinking about other things and so forth. But uh, that two-week period would have been a period that their normal routine would have been significantly disrupted. I trust the same uh, conditions would apply at home if yes. this individual were married. Yes, yeah, very much so. Again, uh, going back to what we just said, that he, he's in control, he's the boss of this uh, situation. Uh, she would not be allowed to ask a lot of questions or demand to know where he's been or whatever, but uh, he would have been gone an inordinate amount of uh, time. Greg, if he is watching this program tonight, what do you think he might be experiencing? Uh, stress. Uh, he's, the only thing this guy cares about, the dominant offender cares about, is, is apprehension. The only thing he's, af he's afraid of is, is that he's apprehended. Uh, and that if he is watching, uh, I want to tell him that you are going to be uh, apprehended. It's just a question of when. Uh, that's the only thing that he's fearful of or stressful of. You're basing, I'm, I'm sure, uh, a lot of these comments on a large number of cases that you have worked on in the past. Can you give us uh, some examples of, of that? Oh, yes, yeah, we do uh, work with a lot, a lot of uh, sexual homicides and things. And one of the other stressors, a point I want to make, too, is that he, uh, it's important to the people that are around him to notice that he presents a danger to them uh, mm -hmm. at this point. Uh, he's under stress, and we see uh, offenders in this situation sometimes act out against the people around him. An example, a case in point, is uh, Ed Kemper on the West Coast who was uh, involved in the abduction and murder of some college co-eds, again, a sexually motivated crime. As the investigation closed in on him, as this thing went on, he, he uh, murdered his mother and then murdered the next-door neighbor after he murdered the uh, mother, his, his mother, just prior to his uh, apprehension. So uh, people out there at risk now uh, may well be the people uh, immediately around him, wives, girlfriends, family, friends, uh, these sort of people. So uh, we would encourage them uh, to call in, if not to solve the cri crime, uh, perhaps uh, to save themselves uh, uh, a tragedy. Okay. We've talked a lot about the dominant character. Let's talk a little about the other side of this relationship. We know there are two. I, so I assume the opposite side would be the submissive offender. Yes, yeah. Uh, again, the majority of the profile we do is with the dominant offender, but there are some things that we can say about the other offender. Uh, again, he's the more submissive, the follower type of individual, and he is more likely to be experiencing some guilt uh, or remorse about this crime. Probably wasn't his idea to kill her, uh, and, and that he, uh, in these situations, not everyone is equally happy with the way that, that a given crime went. And uh, I feel that this uh, offender is probably experiencing some guilt, some remorse. He's having problems coping. And that problem in coping uh, could be seen, evidence, people around him would know that uh, because he's, he's having trouble sleeping, he's having trouble eating, he may see an increased use of alcohol or drugs. Those are all uh, maladaptive uh, approaches to try and cope, to blot out this, uh, this, uh, the memory of this thing in the incident. He's also experiencing fear, the fear of apprehension. He may be uh, uh, fearful of the uh, dominant offender as well. And the dominant offender may also be using uh, uh, increased uh, amounts of alcohol or drugs uh, to cope uh, with his stress or fear. Would this particular individual react the same as the dominant offender if, if he were watching this program tonight? Or would his reaction be different? 
Again, he, the, the difference would be the feeling of guilt or remorse. Uh, I think there's a higher probability that the second offender uh, has uh, guilt, has remorse about the crime. He's, he's, he just doesn't feel good about it and is having, uh, having trouble coping, uh, coping with the crime itself. The dominant offender not having a problem w with the crime, he, his only fear is, uh, is getting apprehended. Is this kind of crime, is it abnormal? to have two people involved in an abduction such as the one we're dealing with tonight? It's uh, a bit more unusual. Usually when we deal with sexual homicides, uh, we're dealing with a lone predator. Uh, a case not too far from you is the Arthur Shawcross, a serial murder case in, in Rochester, dominant offender, lone offender. Many times, whether they're single or serial uh, situation, uh, cases dealing with sexual homicides, it's predominantly a lone offender. However, there are notable uh, cases where we've had two offenders, uh, Lake and uh, Ng uh, in California, a, a fairly recent case, uh, Bittaker and Norris uh, before that in California, the, the uh, Hillside Strangler also out there, Angelo Buono, Kenneth Bianchi. So uh, there are cases uh, where we've had uh, sexual homicides being committed uh, by two individuals. Greg, let's talk a little about these two individuals and their bond. Could they be related in some fashion? All the names that you've given us thus far, there is no relation. Family-wise, I'm speaking Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's, if they're not, re it, it's a very close relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll find a lot of bonding uh, going on. Now, it could be uh, that these individuals may well have met in prison. Uh, we, we feel there is a criminal history or cr a criminal uh, background to these offenders. No one uh, goes from being a, uh, a, a productive, normal citizen and suddenly becomes involved in, in abduction, rape, and murder. It doesn't happen. There's a whole escalation, a whole... Uh, gravitation, a whole evolutionary process uh, that they move toward that, uh, which includes prior criminal uh, activity. So uh, uh, these individuals may well have met in prison. Uh, they may uh, have formed a bond there or uh, whatever, uh, but it's a very close bond. If they're not related, it's almost as though they, it's like being brothers. Again, if you look at Buono and Bianchi, for example, very, very, very close relationship uh, that these guys were together all the time. And uh, the same with Lake and Ng and the, and the Bitteker and Norris and these, the, uh, these pairs. When they get together, it's, uh, they're very, very close. And again, that would be another indicator for the public out there that uh, where you see one quite often, uh, up until this case, you've seen, uh, you will have seen the other. Do they share the same motive in the committing of this crime? Uh, the motive is, is very s similar. You, you mean the two offenders? Yes. The dominant, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, the motive... The motive may have well been uh, the thrill of the abduction and rape, perhaps, for the submissive follower. Maybe he wanted to do an abduction and rape. Is what he may be guilty, uh, feeling guilt or remorse about is the murder. Maybe he wasn't in it for the murder. Maybe he just uh, wanted to rape somebody. Uh, but now that the murder's occurred, this is where the uh, guilt or remorse is, is uh, going to co uh, come in. But their motives are, are uh, similar. They're both uh, criminally motivated uh, uh, offenders. you just got the dominant offender being the the uh, driving force and the, and the more cold-blooded uh, predatory uh, of the two. It sounds to me like the submissive individual that we're talking about here is the kind of person who acts spontaneously, doesn't think out the long-term effects of what he's doing, therefore may feel some kind of remorse down the road when things don't turn out as he anticipated they would. Reality never matches fantasy. They've had a fantasy about the crime and committing it, and, uh, and for all of us, in normal life, uh, a reality never quite matches a fantasy, and it doesn't for the criminals either. Uh, his, again, his only remorse was maybe that didn't work out exactly the way he wanted it. Maybe it didn't fulfill his fantasy. Uh, he may have some regrets about that, but again, I come back to the, to the fact that uh, there'd be a little or no remorse whatsoever for the victim uh, or the family or, or anyone else. There was quite a bit of speculation in the media concerning the fact that Kristen's hair had been cut. Do you give any significance to this fact? Uh, one of two, I would give you two probabilities for that. Uh, one probability is that it is done to disgrace uh, and humiliate and degrade uh, Kristen, the victim. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, this is the, the dominant offender here, someone who has a lot of anger or hostility towards women. Uh, and you have someone uh, like Kristen who had uh, long hair, who uh, for her it was a point of pride. Uh, many women take pride in their hair. And to go in and, and chop it off is uh, an act that uh, is uh, designed to humiliate and disgrace uh, and degrade the victim. That's one probability. Another, a second uh, possibility, and one to keep in mind, I, 
I think it's a lesser possibility, but one that cannot be dismissed is uh, a, a psychosexual disorder uh, where there's a hair partialism or a hair fetish. That is, a, a sexual interest in the hair itself. This is a fairly rare form of uh, paraphilia, which is a psychosexual disorder. Fairly rare form, but it does occur. And the individual here has a sexual interest in the hair, uh, would cut it off uh, because of the sexual, uh, the sexual interest. Uh, the key there, the hallmark there for people around him, that they would know this. If this is the case, if we have someone who has a uh, partialism for hair here, a hair fetish, they would, uh, they would uh, have evidence that. They've been an, uh, an unusual interest in hair throughout their lives, not just at the crime, but they would have asked girlfriend for locks of hair, they may have snipped hair. Cases where we've seen of individuals who have hair partialisms, they go out in public sometimes and just snip hair and take hair from total strangers. So it's, uh, uh, that would be the kind of background. Someone, anyone with an unusual interest in hair uh, that maybe fits these, some of these other uh, things we've talked about as well. That could be another explanation. So to kind of recap briefly, it's one of two things, either done to punish, uh, humiliate, degrade, and disgrace the victim, or perhaps there's a psychosexual disorder where the, uh, one of the offenders has an interest in the hair uh, from a sexual point of view. Okay, Vince, uh, Bevan, and Chuck Wagner are with me here. Uh, and gentlemen, you've heard the conversation we've had. Do you have anything to add or any questions that you would like to uh, ask of Greg? I yes? just like would, uh, would like to make one point, Greg. Uh, we have some appreciation of the amount of information that you need to formulate your opinion. We've had a lot of... Uh, uh, so-called experts in the media up here coming up with opinions. And I think it has really generated an appetite for the public to know what this individual looks like. I know there's been an attempt to, to paint a picture of this dominant offender. Can you help us out with that at all? Uh, that's, that's difficult for us to do here. We deal more with behavioral composites than, 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 than anything else. I think the, uh, the key here is uh, this offender is probably age-wise uh, dominant offender, late 20s uh, into the, the 30s. Uh, this is no kid. This is not a crime committed uh, by some teenager. This is a, uh, a, uh, a more seasoned criminal uh, uh, involved in this thing. So I'd expect him to be uh, an older, uh, uh, older offender. Uh, again, late 20s into the 30s, right in that. The problem we have when we deal with age, and we say this in any of the profiles, and let me, let me say it right now, is that age is the most difficult uh, component to profile because we're dealing with the mental and emotional age of the offender. And what we all know in our everyday experiences is that mental and emotional age does not always correspond to chronological age. We've seen, uh, you know, 30-year-old people behaving like a 12-year-old, so uh, uh, it doesn't always correspond. But uh, and we tell anyone not to exclude anyone based on age alone, but the age, I feel, would be in that uh, late 20s uh, into the 30s uh, age frame for, this, for the individual. Okay, just uh, one more quick mention of the fact, and you mentioned this at the outset of our conversation, Greg, is the fact that if you have any suspicions about anybody in your own immediate uh, circle of family and or friends, uh, you are the one at this particular time, as the news tightens around to this uh, individual who was responsible for this crime, you are the ones that are in danger. Right. Increased More so risk than perhaps people, uh, another Christian. Yes, yeah. Not to, not to discount the fact that he might not act out against a stranger, but there's a, uh, a probability here, too, that he may act out against someone very, very close to him. So people around him, or if there's someone around you, if someone's out there th thinking, gosh, that sounds an awful lot like, you know, this person here, a lot of times the reaction is to deny, and we see this all the time. Can't be him. He's a nice guy. He would never do anything like that. I know that. And, y and we hear that even after we make the arrests. After the arrests are made, gosh, I can't believe he did that. Uh, we have to get over that. The public has to get over their denial and over their fear. And if these things begin to fit, then they need to make a call. Greg McQuarrie, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Chuck, based on your experience as an FBI special agent, what are the chances these offenders will target someone else as they did Kristen? No one can predict the future, Dan. Common sense dictates that reasonable caution be exercised in the community. It would be unprofessional for law enforcement to either overestimate the problem and cause a panic or underestimate the problem and indicate no danger exists. Only the offenders know if they are going to act again. And on that basis, the community must be prepared and look out for one another. There are excellent crime prevention programs available through the police agencies and community programs. The community needs to take advantage of that advice. Okay, let's now go back to Kate Cavanaugh, who is standing by in Burlington, near the spot where Kristen's body was found. And Kate, 
There may be someone watching who thinks they have information. What can they do to be helpful? Dan, the public can be helpful by being aware of the following offender characteristics. Prior surveillance by the offenders in areas where teenagers congregate. Possible prior attempts to lure or con teenage girls into a car, such as by asking for directions. Two offenders who are close, one a leader, the other a follower, with prior criminal histories. Someone who is angry towards women, who has a history of assaulting women, or who is now in a relationship where a female is being abused. Possibly someone with an excessive interest in hair. Someone who works with power tools and equipment or works in an industrial setting. Someone whose normal routine was disrupted during the two-week period between April 16th and April 30th. If someone you know tends to match these characteristics, please call now. Coming up next, a look at Kristen's legacy. And we remind you again, if you have any information that you think could be helpful, call our hotline number. It is 1-800-267-6357. Your information could help prevent another tragedy. The abduction of Kristen French continues. was a straight-A student. Staying on the honor roll was one of her goals. The fact that she repeated as an honor student from grade 9 to grade 10 and her marks at midterm indicated uh, that she would have repeated as well in grade 10 as an honor student. She would have stayed on the honor roll if her life hadn't been taken by a brutal killer. Kristen would have made any parent proud. She'd already given serious thought to her career. Her first love was to be a vet. But she says, Mom, I don't think I could handle that, she said, because I'd have to put some of the animals to sleep. And I don't know if I could be around them when they're hurting. She was also considering corporate law. And those who know her say she would have made it, too. Kristen was exceptionally disciplined, never allowing her work to slide. She wasn't feeling well one day and signed out, but made sure that she came and showed me that her work was done. And I just laughed and said, I, I know. <laughs> I know it. I knew it was going to be done. I think that comes from precision skating. Cold or not, sore back or not, she was there. And uh, would just make a point of being there. Kristen wasn't the kind of girl to be buried in her books all day. She had a lot of friends. Her empty desk, a constant reminder that she was killed. A tragedy that's left Kristen's friends living in fear. I'm scared. I don't like being by myself, you know. I'm really suspicious of people walking down the street. I judge them. An entire generation of students at Holy Cross and beyond have been emotionally scarred by Kristen's murder. Since we came on the air tonight, we have presented a lot of evidence and some important new evidence in the Kristen French case. First, the car. It was a cream-colored Camaro with some rust, with gray primer along the bottom of the driver's door. The interior may have been red or maroon. Second, we now know there were two suspects, one a leader, the other a follower, whose routine would have been disrupted between April 16th and 30th. Third, hair found in the parking lot behind Grace Lutheran Church has been identified as that of Kristen French. Fourth, at least two witnesses saw what may have been a struggle in the car. Five, there were two more key witnesses to Kristen's abduction who have not yet come forward. They are believed to be an elderly couple who were seen more than once in the neighborhood prior to Kristen's abduction, but who have disappeared since. These two citizens could provide valuable pieces to our puzzle. Kate Cavanaugh is back at Grace Lutheran Church in St. Catharines, where Kristen was abducted. And Kate, if you have one final thing to say to these two witnesses, if they are watching tonight, what would it be? 
Well, Dan, I can't emphasize enough how important it is for them to call us. We need to talk. Remember, the Toronto Sun has posted a reward of $100,000 to be paid to the person who provides information leading directly to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for the abduction of Kristen French. And that is our presentation for tonight. We wish to thank all of our expert guests who have contributed both to the investigation and to this program. Vince Bevan, any final thoughts? Dan, this program has been an important component in our investigation. It provided us with the opportunity to inform the public about the facts and hopefully to gather information that will help us solve this crime. I would particularly like to thank CHCH and the team that worked so hard on this production. Thanks as well to CKCO and TVO for carrying this unusual television event. Once more, we wish to remind you that our phone lines are open. This is the regular Green Ribbon Task Force number, and it will be available until this case is solved. Your call could be very important to the solution of this crime. That number again, and please write it down, is 1-800-267-6357. Vince Bevan, thank you. Thank you. And to our audience at home, thank you for watching. We leave you now with Kristen's legacy. Carly S., Ashley, Nadia, Colleen M., Colleen S., and Jennifer. Helmets on over there by the cage, okay? Helmets on. The rest of you girls, come on over here by the bench. Hurry up! Okay. Last batter! These innocent faces, six- and seven-year-old girls, out for a morning of chaotic t-ball. They're having fun. But these kids have much more on their minds. Green ribbons on their uniforms are testimony to that. Green ribbons to remember all missing children. And since the abduction and murder of Kristen French, it's something that's weighed heavily on their minds. Because we care about Kristen French and because she was part of our world and she didn't have to die. These children never met Kristen. They'd only seen her picture and heard her tragic story. Like so many others, they're deeply affected by her murder. I start crying. Because I like her. When she died, I think about her. Because I look on the bulletin board and see her picture. I'm thinking about like how pretty she was and what she looked like and stuff. They feel vulnerable. We always wonder what, why did they, um, why they got stolen. That's why we always think if any more kids get stolen. That's what I'm worried about. Kristen's memory will live on. Trees have been planted, plaques dedicated in her name. The Kristen Don French Memorial Scholarship Fund was set up. Education meant so much to her. $50,000 have been donated so far from people who want to help, but can find no other way to do so except by offering money. All of this for Kristen. Maybe she can see us now and, and um, um, she can see what we're doing and like how we feel and stuff. Kristen's parents believe she can see what we're doing, confident that even though she's gone, she'll never be forgotten.